La cour. The bell chimed at 9.15 on the morning of January the 11th, 2017. The seats of the public benches noisily flipped up, and the judges paraded in. They were wearing blue silk on their left shoulders, pinned under the gold-starred rosette representing the flag of Europe. They stood behind the long, curved wooden benches before taking their seats, looking out on the lawyers for the UK and Philip Harkins. This is the story of how the murder of Joshua Hayes in Florida led to a killing in Scotland, to one of the longest extradition cases in British legal history, and, beyond anyone's expectations, back to the court overseeing the rights of half a billion people. Chapter 5 17 Judges. Please be seated. I declare open the public hearing on the admissibility and merits in the case of Harkins versus the United Kingdom. The application was lodged. This is the before. only audio from any court case in the entire saga of Philip Harkins. Transcripts are available from Florida hearings, but apparently no recordings. And case summaries are available for UK cases, but no recordings and no transcripts. So this hearing of the Grand Chamber of the European Court of Human Rights is the only opportunity to listen in. And it is a climax of Philip's fight to avoid justice in Florida. We've been here before, of course, the European court, but not the Grand Chamber. A lower chamber ruled Philip could be extradited back in 2012. So what changed? It's worth taking a step back and walking through how we got here. First, Remember that appeals to the European Court of Human Rights are made under the European Convention on Human Rights. When I refer to the Convention, I mean the European Convention. And when I talk in this episode about the Court, it's this European Court. The 46 countries signed up to the Convention are called contracting states. The U.S. is a non-contracting state. Russia was a contracting state until it was kicked out for invading Ukraine. It is now a non-contracting state. To review, Philip's first appeal to the court years earlier was under Article 3, prohibiting torture and inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. When you hear Article 3 in this episode, it's for the question of inhuman punishment. Philip also claimed his Article 6 rights were violated, the right to a fair trial. There's one more number, though. Article 35. This deals with whether a case is admissible to the European court. All domestic court options have to be exhausted, and the case can't be substantially the same as a past appeal. Philip already appealed to the European court, so he had to convince them that something had changed so significantly that he should get another shot. And that's what the Grand Chamber has to decide above everything else, whether this appeal is admissible. 
this two-hour hearing isn't just significant because it's the court for half a billion people. It's also the highest court where Phillips' defense offers two versions of what happened on that Jacksonville boat ramp so many years earlier. Version 1. Philip wasn't there. Version 2. If he was there, it was an accidental killing. We have heard those versions before, and in many ways, this hearing is a repeat, except Philip's defense is trying to argue that everything has changed. Philip's appeals always attacked from multiple fronts. We have the main themes, he wasn't at the scene, and if he was, it was an accident. And he said his arrest was unsound. And the murder charge was unsound, because the prosecution collaborated with the police to turn a witness against him. And if he was convicted, he could face the death penalty. And if he didn't face the death penalty, he would be sentenced to life without parole. And that would be inhuman. Philip lost on all those points at every previous UK and European court hearing. As we've heard before, how American police and courts conduct their business does not form part of whether somebody should be extradited. The evidence is also, ultimately, not for domestic courts to test. It has often been argued that both should be considered, but they aren't. The question is, fundamentally, is there a case to answer, and should a person be sent back to a country to answer it? But human rights are a factor in extradition cases. The risk of facing the death penalty has featured in more than one case. And there have been significant cases considering whether a prisoner can be sent to jail for the remainder of their life, or should there be a limit. We heard in the last episode about the cases of Vinter and Trebelsi, and you'll hear them mentioned repeatedly in this appeal. Vinter, remember, said there had to be a possibility of rehabilitation and potential release from prison. Trebelsi was about an extradition to the U.S. where the potential punishment lacked reducibility, so the potential for a whole-life jail term to end at some point, either by a government's clemency or maybe by proving rehabilitation. One last point. This case, Philip's case, had the potential to halt all extraditions to the U.S., the extradition treaty between the UK and US doesn't specify limits on how someone can be sentenced. From the UK's perspective, this case could upend any potential extradition to a non-contracting or non-convention state. And from Philip's defense perspective, that's the very standard there should be. You can find a link to the full hearing along with other legal cases mentioned in the hearing, in the details for this episode. But let's get started. First up, we hear from the UK's representative, James Eady QC. Mr. President, members of the court, this, we say, is a troubling case. The applicant is accused of a brutal murder in the United States. The prosecution alleges that the victim was shot in the face and killed by Mr. Harkins in the course of an armed robbery. The murder took place on the 10th of August, 1999, some 17 years ago. The applicant was indicted for first-degree murder and attempted robbery with a firearm in the Florida courts in February 2000. He fled the United States, for the United Kingdom. He only came to the attention of the United Kingdom authorities following a fatal traffic accident in 2003. Shortly thereafter, extradition proceedings were commenced in March 2003, 
with the English courts determining that the evidence submitted by the US demonstrated a sufficient case to answer in July of that year. Running through the procedural history is standard practice for court cases. But the UK is making a point here. The human rights breaches that Philip is raising in his latest appeal have already been considered. There is nothing new here. And so the case is inadmissible. Mr. Eady said the UK High Court took both Vinter and Trebelsi into consideration. And the court still decided that Philip could be extradited. His second point was about the facts stated in past hearings. There was debate before the High Court and this court as to whether under US law the applicant might face a sentence of life without parole, despite the possibility that the killing was, as he asserted, accidental. It's to be noted that the claim that the gun went off in the victim's face accidentally does not sit well with his primary defence that he was not present at the robbery at all. But in any event, the claim of accident was examined by the High Court in Harkins 2011 in detail. It was examined again by this court in its judgment in 2012, and it was found to be wholly devoid of merit on the facts. The facts were summarized particularly for this purpose in the court's 2012 judgment at at paragraph 139, which we've quoted at paragraph 29 of our observations. For the reasons there given, and as the court put it, quote, on any realistic view, there was no such accident. Philip took a loaded gun to the scene. Does that allow for an entirely accidental crime? Mr. Eady repeated the words of the 2011 High Court ruling. Even if not fired deliberately, the killing took place in the course of an armed robbery. The gun went off only because Mr. Harkins had loaded and cocked the gun before getting out of the car during the course of the robbery and had then hit the victim in the face with it. Thus, and however analysed, should the applicant be convicted after a trial, he would have committed a a, a grave crime. Even on the most favourable realistic view of the facts, his culpability would be high. On the facts of this case, a very severe sentence would be a punishment properly fitting the crime. Mr. Eady again said Philip's appeal was inadmissible. And human rights and the rule of law require what he called legal certainty and finality. And we submit that this application is indeed substantially the same as the earlier one in 2007, leading to the court's judgment in 2012. Both allege that his extradition to the United States to face trial for murder would breach his Article 3 rights. The same murder, the same facts that have been found by the domestic courts to amount to a case to answer, the same charge and the same trial and sentencing regime. And there has been no material change in the clemency processes in Florida since 2012. And the basis for that allegation is precisely the same. Namely, that if convicted, he faces a mandatory sentence of life without parole. And he makes substantially the same case now, as he did in 2012, about the system of clemency. Article 6, the right to a fair trial. Mr. Eady said that was the only part of the latest appeal that was different. But Philip never raised that a decade earlier when he could have at the start of the extradition process. Mr. Eady called it so, quote, hopeless that he didn't address it any further. There were external submissions made to the court as part of this appeal. They looked at the system of clemency in Florida, and they concluded that it was exceptionally rare for the governor to release someone from a life without parole sentence. But Mr. Eady said this was not new information, or at least no more so than what had been submitted on Philip's behalf years earlier. There would need to be new and relevant information. That hurdle was not automatically met because there was new case law, such as Vinter or Trebelsi, 
or updated submissions to the court. This is an interesting point about human rights law, as the UK sees it, that the system couldn't cope with constantly reopening or re-examining cases after every new judicial decision. The court's jurisprudence regularly develops, whether as part of the living instrument doctrine or otherwise. No stable system for the protection of human rights, we say, could bear the burden of reopening applications on that basis. And finally, on this aspect, it is submitted that this application is not simply an attempt to re-litigate precisely the same point which was determined by the court in 2012, but an application to consider a version of the facts more favourable to the applicant than those previously found domestically and in this court's judgment in 2012. Again, he does so not on the basis of any new information. He simply invites reconsideration and hopes that a new tribunal will more favorably interpret the same old facts. Mr. Eady then went back to the Article 3 issue. He focused on whether someone can be extradited to a non-convention state if that foreign nation doesn't have exactly the same system of human rights. He said that even the European Court recognized that it is for individual nations to determine the best sentences for serious crimes. And there are certainly variations across the 46 contracting states. So it is not for Europe to impose its standards on others. Put another way, something which might be a breach of the convention in the system of a contracting state does not necessarily preclude extradition to a non-contracting state. This principle recognizes and respects the fact that not all states are parties to the Convention. Human rights and values may be respected in a variety of different ways across the world. Just because a sentence would be longer in another country doesn't mean it's not compatible with European human rights. Can you respect the rule of law in other countries if you then require them to change it any time they want to prosecute someone who has fled their jurisdiction. Mr. Eady said Article 3 did not prevent any life sentences, nor did it prevent criminals serving life in prison, and it was possible for foreign countries to meet the requirements of Article 3. Again, Mr. Eady pointed out that the U.S. had offered repeated assurances about their system and Philip's treatment if he was returned and convicted. And that's something the UK drew attention to. In Vinter, the case was about someone already convicted and sentenced to a whole life jail term. Philip hadn't even been to trial yet. The position here is particularly and all the more concerning. This applicant would not face justice at all but rather would receive what uh, Mr. Justice Davis uh, described in Harkins 2011 as, quote, a handsome reward for flight. And as the most serious forms of transnational crime continue to proliferate, the court, we say, must guard against the convention being used to limit or impede international cooperation in a way which is contrary to its historic approach to extradition. Mr. Eady said the danger is someone accused of murder avoiding facing justice at all. He summarized their case again and invited the court to declare Philip's application as inadmissible under Article 35 or to dismiss it under Article 3. It was then the turn of Edward Fitzgerald QC, representing Philip. Members of the court, If Mr. Harkins is extradited to Florida, then he will face trial on a charge of felony murder. To convict him of felony murder, the prosecution will only have to prove that he killed unlawfully in the course of a robbery. They will not have to prove any intention to kill on his part, and their own evidence suggests that there was no such intention. But felony murder qualifies 
as first-degree murder. And on conviction, the court would have no option but to sentence him to the mandatory sentence of life without parole for an offence committed at the age of 20. And the sentence of life without parole in Florida is intended to ensure that he will die in prison. That was the clear intention of the Florida legislature when it introduced this draconian sentence in 1994. Mr. Fitzgerald pointed to Philip's young age more than once and that the sentence of life without parole is draconian. Yes, he said, the Florida governor had the power to grant executive mercy, but he said the chances were virtually non-existent. All those facts gave rise to the injustice that Philip brought to the European court. He said the 2012 decision by the lower chamber of the court didn't have the benefit of cases that followed, such as Vinter and Trebelsi. Mr. Fitzgerald laid out his answers to three questions posed by the court to the two sides of the case. We can't see what those questions were, but they are implied by the answers. Why has the case changed? Why would it violate Article 3? Why is mandatory life without parole a problem? In answer to question one, the Article 3 complaint is not substantially the same as that raised in Mr. Harkin's earlier application. It is different because it is made in the light of a significant evolution in the court's own case law and the further substantive protections that were introduced by the decisions of this court in Vinter and Trebelsi. And there is now relevant new information because there have been developments in the United Kingdom. There have been fresh decisions by the Secretary of State, a fresh decision by the High Court to reject the approach in Trebelsi. And that gives rise to a fresh injustice. In answer to question two, we submit that Mr. Harkin's extradition to Florida would violate Article 3. That is because if convicted, he would have to be sentenced to life without parole on a mandatory basis for an offence of felony murder committed at the age of 20. And because, however much progress he makes thereafter, the law of Florida provides him no right to any principled review at any point to determine whether his continued detention is still justified. It's the principled review that is totally lacking. Such a sentence enforced in such a way violates the principles laid down in Vinter and applied to the extradition context in Trebelsi. In answer to question three, we say that the mandatory imposition of a sentence of life without parole for this offence of felony murder would constitute a flagrant denial of justice. That is because the judge would be compelled to impose an extremely draconian sentence without any regard to the individual facts of the case or what he regarded as the appropriate sentence. Extradition to face such a sentence imposed in such a way would violate both Article 3 and Article 6. Philip's defence then went back to the facts of the case. They argued that the type of killing in Florida would not deserve a sentence of life without parole in other European countries. But the account given by the prosecution's own witnesses is that there was an attempted robbery, an assault using the rifle barrel as a weapon, and that Mr. Harkin's gun went off unintentionally during the course of that assault, and he then burst into tears. It was for that reason that the administrative court in England characterised the alleged offence as more, I quote, akin to manslaughter than murder, because it lacked any element of premeditated intent to kill. It is only because it qualifies as felony murder in Florida that it attracts the sentence of life without parole. So Mr. Harkin's alleged offence is totally different 
from the kind of offences that attract sentences of life without parole in European Convention countries. Typically, those cases involve multiple premeditated murders with aggravating circumstances, as in Winter and Hutchinson, or indeed in Kafkaris, where there was multiple killings in a contract killing. This case involves a single killing which would not even qualify as murder in many European countries. That is a unique factor about this case that goes to the Article 3 issue in this particular case. Mr. Fitzgerald turned to the case of Vinter. There had to be a basic quality and purpose of a potential review of someone's jail sentence. He said Article 3, preventing inhuman treatment, was absolute. No extradition could be permitted where inhuman treatment was imposed. He accused the UK of trying to smuggle in exceptions to that rule. If it's inhuman to impose an irreducible life sentence in a convention state, then it is equally inhuman for a convention state to extradite to face such a sentence outside of Europe. The change in geography in relation to this draconian sentence does not alter the inhumanity, nor should it modify the basic test of irreducibility. And in this respect, the requirements of Article 3 are absolute and indivisible, and there is no room for a relativist approach. That much, we say, is clear from the decisions in Cajal, Saadi, and Harkins. And countries such as Portugal, Spain, and France already have an established practice of refusing extradition to serve sentences of life without parole. This is a more fundamental question beyond just one case. Are human rights absolute anywhere in the world, or just the countries that sign up to a set list? Are Europe's rights absolute, or America's? Which rights are more absolute? Were America's rights right when the Bill of Rights and Constitution were written? Were they right after the 13th Amendment banned slavery, but with exceptions? Are they right now that the Supreme Court removed a woman's right to choose? For Philip's purposes, the European Convention should be at the top of the rights mountain, and he can't go downhill to someone else's. The UK government argued that Philip's latest appeal was the same. Philip's defense argued this hearing was in a different legal landscape. That was enough to allow the appeal to go ahead. This was not the same injustice. It was a, quote, new and separate injustice. Mr. Fitzgerald said there was also further new information about the system of clemency in Florida. Then he returned again to Article 3 the extradition was already in breach of Article 3 rights, and Vinter and Trebelsi made the breach even greater. Those cases said there had to be more than a vague possibility of a review in the future of a punishment. It had to be at a certain point in the future, a point set at the time of sentencing. And the review in the future had to be substantive with a defined criteria for the prisoner to potentially meet. Mr. Harkins would have no right at any time under the Constitution of Florida or the United States to say his detention was no longer justified. He could never vindicate any such right in the courts. The effect of Trebelsi is that in the absence of appropriate assurances, no one should be extradited to face life without parole in America under the existing federal system. And in this respect, there's no distinction between the Florida system of review and the federal system analyzed in Trebelsi. Mr. Fitzgerald said the UK's fear that there could be no extraditions at all wasn't true. There were regularly extraditions to the US after assurances were given that there would be no life without parole sentence. He cited deals with Spain, Venezuela, Costa Rica, and France. 
so the case of Trebelsi was another absolute standard. He finally added that life without parole would also breach Article 6. Philip could not get a fair trial if the sentence is a minimum guarantee of life in prison. Depriving the judge of options in sentencing is a, quote, flagrant denial of justice. That was the end of the first hour of the case and the presentations of both sides. Some of the judges asked questions, and then there was a break before Mr. Eady and Mr. Fitzgerald responded. The questions were quite specific to cases or almost hypothetical, but a couple answers are worth highlighting. In particular, Philip's defense said there were a number of alternative options to extradition, and the UK government could have asked for extra assurances from the US. They didn't. That, they said, was a further development to the case. Here's Mr. Fitzgerald. And again, I do stress, we had expressly put to the court, and therefore to the Secretary of State who was represented in the court, the options that were available. Don't prosecute with a, a sentence, uh, an offence that carries life without parole. Undertake repatriation, as is done in other countries. Charge in England, where there would be jurisdiction to deal with a UK citizen, or in the UK, um, a, 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 and uh, fourthly, obtain an assurance, such as is obtained by Venezuela, Costa Rica, many other countries from the United States. We're not inviting the court to reinvent anything, to invent something new. It's the common currency of extradition that requesting states give assurances where what the person would be exposed to on arrival there offends against some fundamental pro prohibition in the requested state. Spain does it, Costa Rica does it, Venezuela does it. Why, why is it suddenly an, 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 an appalling offence to comity or something of the sort for the United Kingdom to request such assurances? His point, again, is that it would be wrong today to extradite someone to Florida to face life without parole. It was wrong in Philip's older case, too. He just hadn't been sent back yet. It would be extraordinary. Just, just imagine the position that my learned friend is taking on Article 35.2b is this. If someone else is being extradited to Florida under the felony convention, the felony con um, murder charge today, he says, oh, well, he, he could run that point. He could run that point. He could put that point to the court and it would have to be determined in the light of Trebelsi, etc. But, because Mr. Harkins was complaining about that very injustice before, and the courts didn't see the injustice, he can't. That's an absurd anomaly. It doesn't suggest a, a, a purposive and broad approach to what Article, Article 35 2b is about. And after about two hours, the case was finished. Gerald, and we have now come to the end of the hearing, I thank the parties for their submissions and answers to the court's questions. The court will now deliberate on the admissibility and merits. The judgment will be delivered later. The parties will be informed of the date of the delivery. I declare the hearing closed. How did you feel the day went? Oh, 
I called Josh's mom, Patricia, a few hours after the hearing. She had watched it all from Florida. Remember, Philip applied to the court, and it took two years just to get a date set. And that was set for months later. All that time, Patricia did web searches every day for any updates. My approach to the family has always been one of patience. Not much ever happened on the UK side, so any eventual reporting was far down the line. But that night in January was when things changed for our relationship. It was the first time Patricia really opened up and started sharing much more than I had heard before. Any media coverage up to this point had been limited. The Florida murder was reduced to a sentence and put in the context of everything that happened after. Part of that was down to me, as the reporter offering updates, maybe once a year at most, to newspapers in the UK. The events of 1999 were more than a decade in the background, and me, being ignorant of Florida, I had no idea how much I could eventually learn from official records. Before I did, Patricia was my guide. And that's also why you hear me frantically writing shorthand notes in these clips. You look over here, this man's asleep, this woman's asleep. But I can understand because a lot of the verbiage, you know, I didn't understand. I'm pretty sure a lot of it they didn't understand. It was helpful for Patricia to watch video of this latest step in the case. She had been limited for many years to getting second or third-hand reports of the extradition hearings. Remember, the original Florida crime was not the center of legal arguments, and the dispute was about extradition. But at the European court, Patricia identified the UK government's lawyer as being on her side or their defense. I could actually see what was happening in the courtroom. And, and I did feel good on our, our defense. I felt like he did good. The other one, and not being biased, it just seemed like he kept covering the same thing that has been covered in all these other court proceedings. Patricia spoke to the state attorney's office on the day of the hearing, and they asked if she had heard from the Department of Justice in Washington, D.C. Patricia said she never has. She was assured that Florida prosecutors were working on the case. For years, they told her, we're ready it's just a matter of getting him back. We had spoken before that, I mean, over the years, I've been, I think, one of the only people that uh, keeps you updated on yes, on these things. Do you ever hear from the Secretary of State or the Department of Justice or anybody with updates? Nope. Um, I hear from the state attorney here when uh, there's something happening, you know, I never hear like, um, you know, like all these appeals he's had and lost or whatever. I never hear them kind of updates. Um, I usually call them and let them know what's going on. Uh, matter of fact, I talked with them today, and they had asked me the question if if I've heard anything from Washington. And I've never heard anything from Washington. You know, and I don't know if that's protocol that they don't contact the family or whatever. But, uh, no, pretty much I, what I hear from you, and I thank God all the time for you, and then I Google, and, you know, I read the stories I find on there, you know, about what's going on over there. Mm -hmm. But other than that, no, I just have to go about and try to, you know, find out my own information. Patricia is keenly aware of the details of her son's murder. Philip's defense in Europe said more than once that the gun went off and it was an accident. Patricia doesn't believe it. They're saying that 
that Josh was shot in the face. That's not a true statement. You know, it wasn't like he hit he hit Josh and the gun went off. It, that wasn't what happened. You know, my son was basically shot execution style. He was shot directly in the head. So to me, that was a clear decision he made. Because as soon as he put that gun to his head, if he would have really cared to be human, he would have dropped it. He would have dropped the gun and walked away. And he made the decision to pull the trigger. And I mean, to be so inconsiderate, I mean, he blew my child's head off. And him trying to say it, it was an accident. Yeah, okay, I understand you're going to say it's an accident because you're fighting for your freedom now. But that's not the way it happened. And just like, you know, it goes back to the point one time he wasn't there and then the other time it was an accident. So where's his credibility over there? You know, that's one thing I didn't understand why the attorney didn't bring up on the credibility. You're saying one time your client wasn't there, but then the, the other, you're saying it was accidental. So he has no credibility. Which one was it? I mean, which story is he sticking to? Because we all, we all know here that he was there. Well, that, they didn't even seem to be disputing that one today. Yeah, I noticed that because he, he the guy said that it was an accident and, and he cried. And, you know, no, he, he he went and washed his car. That's how much remorse he had. That he just left the scene and went and washed the car because he didn't want any evidence found upon the car. So he was then well aware of what was going on. It wasn't like, oh, my God, I shot somebody. Let me call and get help. You know, they left my son laying down there at the boat dock, and everybody left and left him laying there. And another car that had went down there happened to roll up on Josh laying there. But, you know, if it was an accident, why didn't you say, call 911, you know, I shot him try to save him, but no, they just left him down there like a, a dead animal or something. If you, if you feel like you were so innocent, it's like he's trying to say, why did you run? Why, why did you leave? Because he knew he wasn't innocent. Patricia recalled every aspect of the case, even though it had been more than 15 years since Philip set foot in a Florida courtroom. Patricia's perspective of Philip was current. The murder of her son in 1999 was as fresh as yesterday. Josh's killer, in that moment, was the one reappearing at every notch on this long timeline. The European court first said Philip could be sent to Florida in 2012. He appealed again to the court in 2014. It took them three days to put a hold on any extradition. Then they took just under two years to set a hearing date for months later. And Patricia thought she would get a decision on the day of that January hearing. Seventeen and a half years, but it was still 1999. He was 20 years old. He went to rob somebody. He, he hit him with the gun. He went off. It was accidental. He cried or whatever. That is not even what all the witnesses are saying. And it's just so hard to hear that here he is, a murderer, and now he's trying to use his case to get his freedom and, from what I understand, change the laws 
over there with it. And it just hurts me to my heart that if, if you know, they go with his appeal, that he's going to be like coming out smelling like a rose. And it is so hurtful. I mean, I have been on pins and needles waiting for today because I thought some kind of decision would come out today. You know, I wasn't aware that they meet, and then it could be several months again. Like I told my husband, I said, you know, today is going to be a day to be lived out for several more months to a decision made because we're still waiting for that same decision. And it's really hard. All the talk of Philip's potential treatment, if he was convicted left Patricia with little sympathy. But now he's wanting everybody to feel so sorry for Philip Harkins when he has ruined so many people's lives. And not only my family, he's got children. You know, and he's got a mama that I know hurts too. And his children had to grow up without their father and all. And... He just thinks out of all of what he's done and messed up everybody's life that he should serve no consequences. And, you know, I have been fighting for 17 and a half years for justice for our family. And not only, you know, I feel bad for my family, I feel bad for the lady's family that was in the taxi. Because her family lost a loved one. But then it goes back to, you know, the, everything I'm reading is don't make Philip look inhumane and disgrading. He made himself look like that. Nobody else did. When he was here, before he fled, he would walk into the courtroom and look at me and grin and smile at me on his way out of the courtroom. And it was like he was taunting me in my face. And then, which I knew he was going to flee before trial, I tried to tell everybody that, that he was going to run. And then here I sat, 17 and a half years later, and I'm still in the same predicament. Every day, not knowing is there a decision and which way is it going to go. Is all this fighting that I have done to get justice for my son can come back and I can hear in a few words that it didn't happen. And as a mother's point of view, you know, Losing Josh, it's not like, well, I can say, oh, well, that was 17 and a half years ago. I mean, to me, it's like it was yesterday. It's happening now. I was expecting the European court to take even another year before it reached a decision. On Sunday, July 9th, 2017, Patricia called me frantic, having failed to reach me by email. She said a media outlet phoned and wanted her to react live to the ruling of the court the next day. I cautioned her against reacting live. That's just exploitative and unfair. Besides, it wasn't to be that kind of reading out of a verdict. But there was to be a decision the next morning. On July 10th, a majority of the 17 judges of the Grand Chamber voted against Philip Harkins. They added one more 
to the multiple legal rulings that came before. The judges rejected his Article III complaints as inadmissible. They said the arguments were substantially the same as what were rejected five years earlier. His Article VI claims were, quote, ill-founded and rejected unanimously. At 7 p.m. on July 20th, Philip Harkins was arrested for murder by Jacksonville Sheriff's Office. Again. A Murder Without End is reported and edited by Tristan Stewart Robertson. It is produced by Liam Pollock, artwork by Jason Skinner, music by Dylan Anthony. Journalism like this might be free to listen to, but it isn't free to make. A Murder Without End was created without any funding. All research, archive audio, voiceovers, and music were sourced and paid for by myself. So if you enjoyed what you heard, please share it with your friends, leave a review, and visit our website, tomorrow.is, to donate what you can. Any support you can spare would be invaluable. Thank you for listening.